Adab, uh, welcome to Islam After Colonialism, a uh, series of lectures uh, that have, sorry, recording in progress. That, uh, so uh, allow me to begin with a brief description of the series. Uh, across the world, modern colonial rule has not only devastated the economies and ecologies of non-Western societies, it has dramatically transformed their cultures and traditions in innumerable ways. From the replacement of metaphysics and spirituality by historical and political religions to the emergence of divisive nationalism and nation states, the contemporary world cannot be understood without the profound impact of modern white supremacist colonial rule based on modern ideas of racial and cultural segregation, historical superiority and the civilizing mission and national competition for global power and progress. Habib University's Department of uh, Comparative Humanities and the University of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies have launched this fortnightly webinar series to explore not only the radical transformation of regional Islam during the period of modern apartheid colonial rule, but also the living potentials of the pre-colonial past, as well as the urgent decolonial question of what is possible today, what can we do, and how can we live now? And with that brief introduction, uh, I hand it over to my colleague uh, at the University of Exeter, Professor Sajjad Rizvi, uh, to introduce uh, my dear friend and our very distinguished speaker uh, this evening, Sajjad. Uh, thank you, Norman, and it, I think it, it is a, a particularly fitting way for completing this, this year of, of, of seminars as we then move towards the summer break, uh, that we'll be looking at something which is so current, which uh, I think is dear to many people, and it will, I think, hopefully show us uh, not just something which is historical and which is theoretical, but also in, in many ways practical uh, with respect to our, our decolonial question. Um, so with that, it is a pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, who is uh, uh, Professor um, Dard Newman, who is the Hassan Endowed Chair in Classical Indian Music at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, he's very much a specialist who works around uh, the transmission, the performance, the conception of, of Hindustani music in the, uh, the modern era. Uh, and he's also um, the author of a forthcoming um, monograph, which is in many ways directly related to the topic, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, entitled Hindustani Music, Heterodoxy and Modern uh, Traditions. And so in light of that, uh, what he will be presenting today um, uh, is uh, on the topic of heterodoxy and the politics of the popular in post-1857 um, Hindustani music. So without any further delay, uh, I'll pass the, the floor, well, the mic, so to speak, um, to that. Thank you. And um, uh, as I was sharing earlier, uh, Noman and I, um, I was very fortunate to get to know him at, during our graduate school days in New York at Columbia. And to embarrass him, I just want to say in front of all of you that he was my um, elder brother and intellectual mentor in many ways. So I, I'm beyond honored uh, to have been reached out uh, by him and all of you to speak. I also want to say in the spirit of informality and in the, in the logic, uh, uh, in the tradition that uh, I've inherited, um, uh, we don't observe time very well. And, and so uh, I've given Noman the permission to give me the hook if I'm running running late. And there's a small uh, historical, not even an anecdote, but when uh, the radio was first um, kind of uh, moved into circulation in South Asia under British rule, uh, there was this new concept known as airtime. Um, and, and the colonial administrators were thinking, how should we occupy this airtime? And they certainly didn't want to use news because in a circumstance of anti-colonial nationalism, broadcasting news items would be um, you know, problematic, which we'll put under you know, heavy quotations. Uh, so they selected uh, the more austere form of Hindustani music uh, because it's known that uh, we, and I use we, we as my genealogical ancestors, is, we like to just sing and play <laughs> without observing time. So with that, that's my, uh, that's my uh, uh, and a little bit of a warning. 
Um, so this talk is, uh, I'm gonna start reading. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen, sorry. <clears throat> so this talk is a part of my more recent efforts to examine a shift in the relationship between music, affect, and power in Hindustani music from an elite Indo-Persian model found in aristocratic Mughal circles to popular Sufi and Bhakti models. As is well known, uh, after 1857, elite Muslim culture became radically disrupted. I argue that in these conditions, a new class of hereditary musicians emerged to redefine the performance practice of what has now come to be called Indian classical music. And those terms also have heavy quotations, which I won't talk about so much. Ideologically, some of these musicians coming from predominantly low-class communities drew on heterodox Sufi and Bhakti critiques of hierarchy and celebrations of uh, the marginal. Musically, these practitioners synthesized uh, what I'm gonna call loosely popular and elite performance practices. And I'll go into more detail uh, in the upcoming pages. These efforts helped forge a fundamentally new socio-musical aesthetic, one that opened access to women and non-elite lineages. And as such, I would like to suggest, represents a type of indigenous modernity formed in, but not defined by colonial conditions. This paper uh, will examine the ideological components of this movement, and I've tried to set aside some time to uh, gesture to the musical components. Well, I promise I will. What I'd like to demonstrate is that ex extraordinary socio-musical innovations took place among uh, these non-elite and marginalized musicians who synthesized um, these anti-hierarchical popular spiritualities with elite Shastric and Indo-Persian classical precepts Ironically, not to reinforce hierarchies, but to democratize the propagation of music. <clears throat> Among these precepts uh, was a series of permutation combination frameworks found in the 13th century Shastric treatise, the Sangeet Ratnakar, and I'm gonna demonstrate uh, some of those precepts. This framework known as, as Mirkand allowed musicians to explore mathematical combinations of notes available in an aesthetic field known as rag, which many of you know. And with this innovation, musical learning was no longer solely dependent on in the inherited repertoires of oral compositions that had been the exclusive preserve of elite lineages. So through the integration of three data types, observational by way of music analysis, behavioral by way of family and pedagogical genealogies, and anecdotal by way of oral histories and biographies written by musicians really from the 1940s, I demonstrate how the performance practice of the 20th century was importantly produced uh, by these musicians who were excluded from traditional definitions of the classical and mogul and colonial conditions. In order to appreciate the Sufi Bhakti ideological component, I wanna posit, if you'll forgive me, a kind of perhaps reductive uh, framework that revolves around the relationship between music, affect, and what I'd like to call the politics of spirituality. As is well known, music in South Asia is inextricably linked to the spiritual. What is less discussed, however, are the political dimensions of these spiritual traditions, specifically how some contest while others reinforce political and social hierarchies. What I want to posit is a framework that plots cultural traditions along two intersecting continuums. On the x-axis, we plot popular and elite traditions, and on the y-axis, we plot worldly political uh, on the bottom side and the worldly renouncing traditions. In each of these quadrants, music, or more accurately organized sound, plays a central role in the politics of spirituality. On the left side, on the popular side of the quadrant, music works with sacred verse to excite ecstatic responses, understood as the state approximate union with the divine. And on the elite side, on the right side, uh, music works to control and discipline emotive states. I'd like to suggest that this framework, uh, I would distinguish this from the Orientalist idea of the spiritual as a realm separated from the political and the economic. This would be kind of the Max Weber, Louis Dumont dimension that would really view the top right quadrant as the fundamental kind of index centric quadrant. I'd also distinguish this from the Nirgun Sagun framework that distinguishes deities with anthropomorphic or manifest form from those without attributes, as well as from a civilizational set of frameworks that draw hard lines between Indic and Islamic traditions. 
What I hope this framework will provide as I move into the primary material is an orientation that more clearly accounts for traditions that are fundamentally hybrid and whose hybridity is more clearly revealed when the relationship between music, affect, and power are brought into analytical forefront. Um, and so I'd also like to argue finally that in Hindustani music, the modern history of Hindustani music involves an active synthesis of these different traditions along all four of these quadrants. A process of hybridity that started as Mughal rule waned in the mid 18th century and then intensified as Mughal rule ended after 1857. Okay. The upper right quadrant is represented by the figure of Swami Haridas. Is a, and he's a familiar figure in the world of Hindustani music. Um, is this a spiritualism that's separated from the political and the material? He does not seek and actively rejects imperial recognition. He is neither cowed by its expansionist power nor seduced by its material riches. The spiritualism has a politics in its refusal to recognize earthly power, but it's fundamentally apolitical in that it disavows the social. But differently, Swami Haridas is the figure of the world renouncer as established by the sociological lineage from Max Weber, Talcott Parsons to Louis Dumont. The Brahmin who forsakes the social as the precondition for achieving moksha, for liberation from the worldly cycle of birth and death, or at least he is said in some versions of the story to have achieved. Those involved in the world of Hindustani music are well acquainted with the story surrounding Swami Haridas's famous disciple, Han Sen, the court musician to Emperor Akbar. When Akbar grew curious to hear the master of his prized court musician, he dressed as a peasant and hid behind a tree to overhear a lesson between the wandering ascetic and his court disciple. The experience did not disappoint. Swami Haridas sang with such an impact that it brought the emperor into an ecstatic response marked by uncontrollable weeping. Later, after returning to his court, Akbar asked Han Sen why his music lacked such effective power. And that question is pretty profound because he had conferred upon Han Sen a very unique privileged status as of being one of his nine jewels. <clears throat> Tansen's response, uh, apocryphal response, was that whereas he merely sang before the emperor, his teacher, his guru, sang before the divine. The stories told by musicians uh, marking the move of elite uh, music in South Asia from the spiritual to the professional domain. The story also marks a genealogical origin point. Most musicians to this day represent some type of lineage and linkage to Tan Sen. Such a linkage marks an elite pedigree as well as authenticity to the authority of repertoire. The musicians I'm examining, however, are not descended from this Kalavant lineage, uh, though they do recognize some pedagogical linkages. How are these lineage, these musicians kind of on the right half here are understood within the community of musicians to come from accompanist backgrounds, even if some ascended to the level of solos. Their backgrounds were as wandering bards, midasis, dhavis, or kavalis, you know, singers of Sufi music, or non-musical communities such as weavers. We will return to this meta lineage shortly. <clears throat> the traditions on the left two quadrants include Sufi and bhakti traditions that provide divine recognition to traditionally marginal members of society, hence my use of the term popular. The egalitarianism of these movements takes place through the more universal access of divine union. As many of you know, in the Vedic text, salvation was restricted to Brahmin males. The later Bhakti and Sufi movements opened salvation to others through emotions of love and the desire for union, uh, emotional pathways, of course, not restricted to class, caste, and gender. The difference between the top and bottom half of the left two quadrants have to do with orientations towards power where the traditions on the bottom left are anti-hierarchical and more likely to be critical of established hierarchies and orthodoxies, the traditions on the top left are more conformist and more likely to reproduce hierarchies. As we know, many, though not all, Sufi and Bhakti movements were led by singer saints who came from humble backgrounds. They enlarged their movements through song and social services, providing material support and spiritual uplift for the majority of dispossessed subjects. As mentioned, music was central to these socio-political movements as the lyrics and music work to provide recognition, dignity, and affective inspiration, right? To be moved into a state of union. Many of these traditions orient their lyrics explicitly uh, in a political way, uh, which I'll just kind of give, you know, just to remind us, right? We all know about Ravidas who um, uh, uh, railed against caste hierarchies and spiritual orthodoxies. Um, we know about Kabir, who was an equal opportunity critic of existing religious orders, hierarchies, and orthodoxies. Um, 
kind of a 15th, 16th century uh, figure who figures centrally into many uh, musicians' landscapes. Um, and I just want to play just a kind of a contemporary example of uh, just kind of an explicit politics. <laughs> This is a performance uh, in the United States. Um, within the context of South Asia, uh, some of our colleagues, uh, and I'm speaking specifically of Purita Mukta, has done field work in Rajasthan and found that um, with Mirabai, uh, followers of Mirabai, the, the bhajans, the songs were quite explicitly political and expressed not the kind of figure of Mirabai who kind of has a hapless devotion to Krishna and is nothing without her beloved and emaciates herself uh in the absence of the presence of the beloved but really more the logic of um the protector and uh the the the, the narratives as sung in the contemporary moment are explicitly critical of uh, aristocracy of patriarchy uh and the like so this is i mean there's evidence of contemporary practices that you know follow this logic uh and even um your own uh, wonderful Abida Parveen sings some Sufi uh, songs that have this kind of anti-orthodoxy built in. I'll, I'm going to, in the interest of time, uh, kind of move along. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to focus on is a series of socio-musical innovations taking up, taken up by musicians from what I'm going to call the Bhiram Khan Biradri. A Biradri is a social kind of network that transcends musical lineages. Uh, but is contained by rules of endogamy, uh, either literally marriages and or pedagogical. The Hiram Khan uh, and, uh, you know, dates are a little bit flexible, um, but uh, the, to the best that we know, he lived, you know, in the 1800 to 1878. He's remembered today as an elite musician and forefather to the uh, Drupad lineage of the Doggers. However, mid 20th century oral histories and family genealogy suggest a more complex history, positioning him as a low caste buddy right, a community of bards and accompanists, and an outsider to elite lineages. My interest in focusing on this interpretive angle is not to resuscitate an old smear charge. Rather, what I wish to show is how a network of musicians from outsider communities work to disseminate musical knowledge more broadly to other marginalized figures, and quite honestly, were pretty central in redefining the aesthetic that many of us have inherited. <clears throat> This, geni this ideological stance by can be gleaned in early anecdotal narratives. I'll give a few examples. And let me just see how I'm doing. Okay. So now we're getting more, I'm moving from the framework to really more the original research, uh, if, if I can put it that way. <clears throat> so this uh, anecdote concerns the musician Bande Ali Khan. You see his um, image there, who was alive 1830 to 1890. We don't have any recordings of his music, but uh, many musicians today trace uh, a pretty direct lineage to him. Uh, there's some evidence that he was the son-in-law of Hiram Khan uh, and learned from him. And he also was remembered as an elite court musician. But yet again, early narratives from musicians position, ha position him as a defiant outsider, pushing against elite protocol with irreverence against courtly power. I'll read from an anecdote penned in the 1940s by a hereditary musician from a rival lineage, Belayat Hussein Khan. And just by way of kind of evidence, a lot of the narratives that I'm utilizing really kind of emerged in the early 40s and early 1950s. Uh, the voices of the musicians were sort of uh, in the archive. They're there pre-1857 when the musicians were uh, elite musicians and tazkidas were, were written by them or of them. And then that kind of narrative form disappears for about 100 years. And we don't kind of hear from musicians themselves until the 1940s, when they start writing their own biographies and when musicologists and people such as myself start interviewing them. So the, the archive of their own words starts to reemerge in the 1940s. And what I'm trying to say is this new archive is a fundamentally modern archive and it represents the kind of a different lineage. The reason why the biographical voice goes silent is because the elite musicians essentially died out after 1857. So this was written by Vlad Hussein Khan, who comes from a rival lineage. And I'll read, it's, uh, just translating. Um, I've heard from my elders that Bandi Ali Khan was by nature a fakir, 
and was immersed in his own thoughts, not caring for kings, aristocrats, and nobility. <laughs> Once the Nizam of Hyderabad invited Bande Ali Khan to his court, he started playing the bean and the Nizam was in a trance. While playing, Bande Ali Khan started coughing and started spitting in the Nizam's golden spittoon and then started playing again. The Nizam listened to him, immersed in his music for hours. When the Jalsa, the performance, concluded, he told his servants to send a spittoon to Khan Sahab, the musician. When, ben, when Bande Ali Khan heard this, he said, I don't want this thing in which I spit, end of quote. Bande Ali Khan's impertinence can be read as statements against traditional authority and feudal power. He will not perform his place and wait to be summoned and dismissed. He will come and go as he pleases. He will not provide linguistic flattery. He will make his entrance with effrontery. He will not observe the oratic separation between the Lord and court servant. He will transgress the threshold. Indeed, the Ustad, the maestro, literally spits into the Nizam's golden spittoon and then refuses the Nizam's gesture of accommodation, the presentation of his spittoon as a gift. As uh, a lot of you know, the political economy of the gift is deeply charged. It produces the burden of reciprocation, not just with other objects, but with observance, observance of gratitude, of servitude, and love. Unlike forms of commodity exchange in capitalist societies, where social relations between the exchanging parties are neutralized with the trans transaction of money, gift exchange produces and reproduces hierarchical relations among the exchanging parties. What transfers with the material gift is also the spirit of the gifter, that which possesses and compels the receiver to reciprocate. I'm applying a little bit, maybe perhaps too much Marcel Mauss here. But to receive a gift from no nobility then includes both the actual acquisition as well as the embodied incorporation of the nobility spirit. Conversely, to refuse a gift is to refuse this incorporation and in some ways to refuse recognition. Bandi Ali Khan upsets feudal authority then at two levels. In refusing the Nizam's gift of the spittoon, he refuses to incorporate the being of the king, which implies that he refuses to recognize the king's hierarchically elevated status relative to him. But perhaps most scandalous of all, he obliges the king to repos repossess the now desecrated object. The king must incorporate Bande Ali Khan's being in the form of his defiled gift, since it is beneath him to accept it. What you're seeing here also is a kind of a genealogical chart. Uh, you don't have to attend to every detail, but this is the larger Padadri, or network of musicians that I'm charting out. And so I'm kind of integrating in my work kind of three data points, music analysis, narrative analysis and genealogies. Um, and uh, so I'm just kind of keeping this in the foreground. Uh, there are many such examples in the mid 20th century narratives from hereditary musicians. Another example concerns another lineage within this Padadri. Uh, uh, and the following story is narrated by Chand Khan. You see his picture on the bottom left, uh, concerning his grandfather. And this was penned, actually it was spoken first in the 1940s during the memorial of his father, Maman Khan, who was a, a sarangi player, uh, which is the bowed fiddle. It was published in Urdu in the 1960s. The memorial begins with a critique of hereditary entitlements and counters with a Sufi appeal to the contingent universality of humanity before divine eyes. So what I'm doing here is I'm moving from Bande Ali Khan's critique of nobility to now what's gonna be an internal critique you're gonna see the network of hereditary musicians critiquing themselves, uh, which uh, for me is, I think, very interesting. So I'm quoting now. It is a fact that art and artistry is not inherited by either community, religion, or family. And just keep in mind, this is being expressed by a hereditary musician, someone who comes from a multi-generational you know, lineage. So he's in a way disavowing the hereditaryship of uh, a profession, even as he's coming from it. The art, and he's saying this in a kind of a modern moment, right? The 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. <clears throat> the art belongs whoever excels in it. The art of music depends on its performance. We believe in the fact that human beings are descendants of Adam and the whole world is a family. For this reason, we never evaluate the status of the families and differentiate between them. We consider these hierarchical differences as mere legends and do not give them credence. You have to understand that what I'm trying to argue for here is I'm not trying to argue for a utopia, right? I mean, this is absolutely a still a patriarchal hierarchical tradition, but within a kind of patriarchal hierarchical tradition, there are these counter elements. And so his critique here is not just a feudal hierarchy. He's critiquing his brothers and sisters who, even if they 
elevated from the margins reinforced new orthodoxy. So this is kind of an internal critique. Um, so this presidential address opens by engaging the modern narratist narrative of music's decline. But this is not the typical Orientalist rant against a fallen Mughal present uh, set against a glorious Hindic past. Rather, the hereditary musician diagnoses the cause of music's decline as issuing from a feudal mentality that persists among his fellow brothers and sisters and hereditary musicians as well as their connoisseurs. Indeed, Chand Khan comes close to negating the dominant institutions that inform old world identities, ethnic community, religion, family. He argues that artistry is earned and not inherited. It is manifest in the ephemerality of performance and not displayable as tangible heirlooms. It belongs to all, and not a Brahmanical base or an Abrahamic faith. Chand Khan rejects the religiosity of music even as, even as he speaks through the language of Sufism. He discredits the logic of inherited entitlements, even as he belongs to a long line of hereditary musicians. What transforms Chan Khan's orientation regarding old world tradition from respect to repudiation are forms of caste, class, and gender degradation and discrimination, especially as it pertains to the accompanist and the courtesan. Chan Khan writes an origin story about the expulsion of the Sarangi and the Pawaif from his own family. So here, his critique is not just to other lineages, which he does, and it's not just to the Lord, which he also does. Now he's doing a deconstruction, a critique of his own family. Um, so he vehemently rejects the cultural charges that the Sarangiya, the bowed fiddle, is an inferior musician because it merely accompanies the soloist, and that the Tawaif is a bearer of indignities. In a section titled Family's Hatred for the Sarangi, what a wonderful title, he writes, during the uprising of 1857, many court musicians were affected and driven away from their homes. They came to Haryana, right, close to Delhi, to seek shelter and protection with my great grandfather, with the great grandfather of my grandfather. <clears throat> this patriarch extended all possible hospitalities to guests, except he did not offer his smoking pipe to them. During that period, denying the privilege of smoking from the common pipe was considered a severe punishment issued from the community and amounted to a type of excommunication. When the guests questioned the host on this issue, they were told that they were associated with Sarangi players and in the service of Tawais. Maman Khan's father considered this statement to be an insult. He took the decision that he too will play the Sarangi until it gains recognition as an instrument of high order, which is its due. His family held a meeting and they tried to dissuade him, but he was totally intoxicated, right, must, with conviction. When his family members realized he could not be dissuaded, they unanimously excommunicated him from the family. He, along with his wife and children, proceeded to Delhi with his in-laws. To the end, he did not visit or see his father and grandfather. He did not make any claims on his paternal property. The family members used to refer to him as Sarangi Khan, which in time got transformed into Sangi Khan, and nobody remembered his original name." End quote. We have here one of the few explicit mentions of the 1857 rebellion and its impact on the life of music by hereditary musicians. In this telling, the patriarch admits the exiled and migrating musicians for protection, but denies them access to the common pipe. The gesture is meant to provoke a choice, renounce the Sarangi and the Tawaif to regain the status of respectability. Maman Khan's father refuses. He will fight for, the, fight for and side with the Sarangi, his in-laws, and the dignified place of the Tawaif. Sarangi Khan moves back to Delhi with his in-laws. He forsakes his inheritance and cuts ties with his father's side of the family. An entire patrilineal link is severed, as are his ties to a patriarchal lineage system. His given name, in turn, is forgotten. His nickname, Sangi Khan, stamps the sublineage with the permanent sign of his choice. He embraces the stamp, that of an accompanist of a Sarangi player. He embraces his matriarchal lineage and teaches the Sarangi to his offspring. Um, Bundu Khan is a very well-known Sarangi. <clears throat> Chan Khan's critique, let me just see how I'm pulling. Okay, good. Chan Khan's critique moves from the nadir of Mughal rule in 1857 to its apex under Akbar in the 16th century. He even takes aim at one of the most sacrosanct and revered musical figures, Tan Sen, who we've encountered, and the elite narratives of authority attached to him. He argues that other lineages deserve recognition. Left here, Chan Khan's critique would be limited to the political economy of monarchical recognition, merely expanding the range of lineages favored by imperial eyes. Chan Khan goes further, however, moving to demystify such a form of imperial recognition altogether. Continuing his polemic, Chan Khan repudiates monarchical hierarchy, feudal culture, and high art values altogether, 
celebrating the depth instead of what we might today call popular culture. He contrasts the more flexible genre of khayal, which literally means imagination, with the more austere and traditional dhupad form, kind of the so-called classical form. So I quote again, khayal is associated with the mood and rhythm of the congregation of the followers of Sufism. The expert exponents of khayal were themselves staunch believers of Sufi philosophy. They did not appreciate the seating arrangement of the congregation, wherein the artist in singing in praise of Allah and his messenger was made to sit on a lower seat than the emperor. During this period, Drupad had transformed into mere eulogies where praises were showered on kings and emperors. The kings and emperors used to be pleased on hearing these and they used to bestow rewards on the artist. This was so far-fetched that Drupad is found even in praise of Emperor Rangze, who was a confirmed antagonist of the musical tradition." End quote. From a stereotypically elite perspective, court traditions require the highly refined sensibilities of nobility. Popular traditions, by contrast, were superficial forms of entertainment for the common folk. Chand Khan reverses these high-low associations, essentially deriding elite music for its elitism. Drupad gained favor in the royal courts, he argues, through its appeal to the narcissism of nobility. Such panegyrics speak to the banality of flattery and not to any depth of expression. Chand Khan presents as his coup, coup de grace the Drupad sung in praise of Aurangzeb, the Mughal emperor so notorious in his austerity that he famously banned music from his courts. What kind of depth could issue from a tradition dedicated to such obsequious uh, prostrations that it celebrated a figure responsible for its expulsion? What I'm, trying to, <clears throat> what I'm trying to suggest is that the manifestation of anti-hierarchical political movements uh, can be gleaned in oral oral histories of musicians from this pedagogy before they achieved renown and affected their own orthodoxies. And I want to be really straightforward. Again, this is not a utopian narrative. Many musicians elevated and some affected their own reversals and their own orthodoxies. <clears throat> and I'd like to suggest that this history is also evident through music analysis of musical recordings from 1901 onwards, which suggests a hybridizing of popular and classical performance practices. Interestingly, this network of musicians also acts as classical precepts, especially from the Sangeet Pratnakar, a 13th century the the theoretical treatise in Sanskrit. Oral history has Bahiram Khan dressing himself as a Brahmin to access learning of the treatise, a narrative of unauthorized appropriations that's common in the world of Hindustani music. It's more likely he accessed the treatise in their translation to Persian due to Indo-Persian interest in Indic classical sources. What's more relevant is less the kind of origin story of access and more the, the evidence of appropriation. Uh, and I use that term, I'll come back to it. Because what I'd like to argue is you see evidence of Shastvic principles and practices in the pedagogy and performance of this non-elite Badadri. And you see the absence of evidence of these principles with elite musicians and elite lineages. I also argue that musicians from this lineage deployed classical knowledge, not in a manner of Sanskritization to obtain signs of high caste privilege, but for popular propagation, right? Principally because these precepts had rational frameworks uh, and provided a means for approaching improvisation that was not dependent on inherited repertoires. It was, it was obtainable through individual exploration of mathematical principles applied onto aesthetic, um, uh, an aesthetic tapestry. So I created a transcription model that allowed me to, one, provide empirical lines of distinction between improvisational structures that, um, well, let me actually describe this a little bit. And yeah, I'll be able to do this in the next set, seven minutes. I'm not gonna speak to all the precepts uh, that we find in the Sangeet Bhattanakar. I kind of list four here. I'm gonna sp speak about permutation and combinations, what's called uh, Mirkand. So it, in, in this treatise, you see the working out of mathematical combinations. So in a one note series, there is no combination, it's just one. In a two note series, it's two combinations, one, two, two, one. Um, you know, and I'm gonna now talk about a four note combination which has 24 combinations. You can see on the bottom left, set A, uh, you know, our, our solfege, Sarigama Padanisa. I'm just gonna translate Sarigama to one, two, three, four. So Sarigama, one, two, three, four, two, one, three, four. One, three, two, four. Three, one, two, four. Two, three, one, four. Three, two, one, four. 
these can be transposed into the kind of melodic framework. So you can say rag yaman, one, two, three, four. Two, one, three, four. One, three, two, four. I won't go through all the combinations, but part of our work is not just mathematically exhausting all combinations because this isn't math, right? This has to take place within an aesthetic field. So part of what you're exploring are combinations that are both allowable by the rag, but also give some sort of pleasure to the practicing and researching musician. <laughs> so um, what I've done is, uh, created a model to try to empirically delineate, you know, every kind of musical phrase is a combination of one manner or another. So how can we draw a line between combinations that might um, be evidence of this permutation combination pedagogical approach? Uh, and I've, ex I've accessed this through anecdotes and oral interviews, right? How have you learned? Uh, but here, let me give you an example of uh, one of the musicians from this Puradri, Abdul Lahid Khan, who was kind of known and remembered as a very traditional and orthodox religiously observant um, musician, um, but affected one of the most radical kind of approaches to music and pedagogy. So here he's singing a, a, a khayal that's about, you know, meditating on Allah. But you'll note that unlike in a Kavali song, he's permutating not just the line, not just the melodic lines, but the lyrics so that the, the integrity of the lyrics are themselves broken up in a kind of <laughs> perhaps an unintended subversion. So uh, if we are to accept that he was observant, the subversion is not happening at the level of content. Uh, it's happening at the level of content, but it's really being provoked at the level of form. So I'm going to play this and try to if, see if you can follow along. The, I'll, I'll try to on the cursor show the improvisations. <laughs> I'm going to contrast this to the elaborations in the same rag, Multani, a Kesar by Karkar, an extraordinary musician who learned from the elite uh, lineage of Alad Dev Khan. Just a, just a 30 seconds. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm representing here is, you know, through this kind of transcription model, is let, let's show the different ways in which the musicians elaborated on a particular note. I mean, one can't do this scientifically because one performance is 18 minutes long, the other is three minutes long, but I've done this with comparable uh, performance of lengths. But um, what you see here is um, a elaborate form of permutations and combinations in the improvisation of Abdullah Khan from this kind of badadri that I'm talking about. And a more, um, uh, lack of better word, I don't even know what the word is, disciplined approach. And I'm not making an aesthetic judgment, case or by, is extraordinary. But uh, let me just give you an example of uh, Abdullah Khan. So seven would be ni. Five, seven is pani. Four, five, seven is ma pani. Four, six, five, seven. Five, four, seven. Six, 
6547. 517. 217. 34, uh, 217. So it, this is the type of kind of research and exploration that's actually applying a lot of pressure against the rag. Other elite musicians would kind of not recognize all these phrases as being legitimate, but this is a kind of a exploration that is transmissible, transmittable to musicians who aren't necessarily learning repertoire. So uh, I'm coming to a close here. So what I did was try to cr create this transcription model that allowed me to provide empirical lines of distinction between improvisational structures that drew on these permutation precepts and those that did not, and to map those data onto genealogies and oral histories to show which networks of musicians drew on these innovations and which did not. And so the, through the integration of these three data types referred to above, right, which is observational music analysis, behavioral genealogies, and oral histories, the attitudinal. I'm working to demonstrate how the performance practice of 20th century uh, music, Hindustani music, was importantly produced by musicians who were excluded from traditional definitions of the classical in Mughal and colonial conditions. Indeed, these musicians and their musical innovations broke from hierarchical traditions and provided social mobility for musicians from low caste and class groups drawing on both the popular anti-hierarchical elite and bhakti ideologies with a synthesis of popular musical forms. And I haven't talked about this, that kind of escalate into kind of rhythmic intensity for ecstatic effect, as well as the more kind of elite classical uh, mediations uh, as kind of elaborated by these permutation combinations. Um, <clears throat> so this pedagogical and performance form allowed musicians who were excluded from traditional definitions of the classical to obtain uh, this information and ascend, uh, kind of achieve social mobility. My final sentence. Um, indeed, I'd argue that these musicians and their musical innovations broke from hierarchical traditions and provided social mobility for musicians from low caste and class social groups. This entire baradri or network of lineages all came from communities subordinated and considered outside the authoritative, lineage, authoritative and elite lineages. There is evidence that all of these uh, musicians came from uh, uh, lineages that had sarangi and tabla performers, which is to say accompanists of the tavais, uh, and therefore to the colonial history of the anti-Notch movement. This is not to say that the socio-musical movement was revolutionary, utopian, or even subaltern. Many of these musicians achieved renown as evidenced by their photographic presence and, and sonic presence in the archive. Nor is it to suggest that other lineages were also not uh, important or uh, had important contributions to make. It is to argue, however, that the efforts to open access to non-elite outsiders with a new aesthetic represents a type of indigenous modernity formed in, but not defined by colonial conditions. And there I'm done, hopefully three minutes over. Sorry, not as bad as I feared. And if you just see here, like I've added some pictures, but again, the point is all these lineages can be traced. Uh, all of these have ancestors who are Sarangi players, uh, to wives, and uh, uh, represents both from a genealogical perspective, as well as from a oral history perspective, as well as from a music analysis perspective. What I'm arguing for is a kind of coherent uh, baradri. Okay, bye. I'm all yours. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, there was a really thrilling uh, presentation with so many layers and uh, things to think about. Um, so a couple of uh, thoughts and questions uh, that I had to start off with. So one of the uh, one of the things I was struck by once again, when you're describing the kind of subversive sensibility, I think uh, it's Bande Ali Khan, uh, his uh, sort of confrontational attitude towards the nobility uh, uh, reminded me of, uh, you know, parallel 19th century phenomenon, uh, the dandies, yeah? So more aristocratic uh, than the arist uh, aristocratic class, which was, uh, of course, of great interest, that figure, uh, especially in the form of, uh, you know, uh, Baudelaire, uh, who is the subject of the Yemen study. Uh, yeah. uh, was fascinating to Benjamin. Uh, also, uh, the figure of the dandy. 
So, um, yeah, it's a form of, I mean, uh, the famous uh, dandy Bo Brummel, for instance, you know, against the regent, uh, he went head to head. And really, it was over uh, some petty matter. And, and But he, Bo Brummel, resists giving uh, the prince regent, who really desperately desires it, uh, a start the the formula for the starched collar because it was Bo Brummel who invented the starch collar and then uh, you know he just wouldn't give it to the prince regent who was dying to get the you know the, but uh, he came from a, you know so Bo Brummel says about his own background he says uh, you know my father was a stable boy or some horse keeper or something so he's very con contemptuous of his own class background totally the idea of being self-made are these figures so the one of the questions that you know in in lucknow around this time also in the uh, post 18 i mean around that time the, the famous figure of the banka yeah the uh, the bankas of lucknow which some people have written about uh, although i wish there was uh, you know like a, a full monograph length exploration of that but these musicians are kind of dandies this uh, new you know and what Baudelaire says about the dandy um, uh, in that essay of his Painter of Modern Life, he says, the, uh, you know, the dandy appears when the old uh, is dead and the new is not yet born. So it's in this, uh, uh, which is, I guess, the period where you begin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so absolutely. Uh, I, I remember uh, back in the Nenoman when you, you, know, you were talking about the figure of the dandy, and I've thought about this actual figure. And I would say it's absolutely in play um with many of these musicians and i we could do a photo essay of the regalia and the pose in front of the photograph um the uh, the, the the kind of formalities um and i guess what i would argue for is a kind of a hybrid of the figure of the dandy with the kind of uh sufi bhakti you know middle finger um uh, and uh, <laughs> And that's why I kind of started with that framework, and I hope that wasn't too tedious for all of you, because I, I do think that there is uh, that the, at the that this isn't that this is a fundamentally modern phenomena that's representing a synthesis of kind of a uh, of a heterodox and heretical Sufi bhakti form uh, with kind of the modern conditions and the figure of the dandy absolutely is at play. You can see some of these musicians and the in the suits and the regalia, the, the specs, uh, enjoying uh, the camera, even if they're awkward, right? There's a kind of, and, and so I, I would, I would uh, absolutely agree with your, uh, you know, positioning these as, as similar types of moments and, and, and uh, instances. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, uh, he, you, uh, you, you, of course, know him much better, but uh, I remember seeing Vilayat. I only saw one um, uh, uh, one concert of Vilayat Khan's. Uh, yeah. He was uh, performing at uh, the museum in New York. Um, and he was so dandy-esque. I mean, he's, uh, he's uh, the, uh, the, just the sheer exquisiteness of uh, uh, you know his attire which he had obviously given a lot of thought to uh, yeah. and, and then his entire posture of course it's all it's all very deliberate yeah, uh, also uh, and learned I mean there's a whole etiquette so just for, uh, I, I I've studied I come from that lineage not like so his son is my teacher and I also learned from his Gurubai uh, who was elder to him and uh, the stories of how he would make his brother or like iron his kurta for hours before a concert. Uh, I've grown up with plenty of stories with the nephews and about their attention to the kind of shawl, the kurta, the specs, you know, whether it's from Italy, Kashmir or whatnot. So 100%. And, and the etiquette, the adab, the whole mannerism is built into the quotidian. It's, it's, it's not just affected on stage. It's, it's a part of the household I've spent you know, <laughs> a lot of time in that household. Yes, I yeah. know. And yeah. actually it goes in Vilayat, uh, the politics also kind of uh, uh, goes with the, what we've been talking about because he refused the uh, Padma Bhushan, right? Yeah. That's the award that he refused. He said, you guys, uh, you're not in a position to give me an award. What do you know? 
right? Okay. Right. <laughs> this this was his uh, this this was his attitude towards the industry. I mean, it's the most aristocratic gesture <laughs> possible, right? Uh, and for me, the dandy as you position it is really useful because one thing I'm not trying to claim. Uh, uh, is that Vlad Khan, as a world-renowned musician and somewhat well-off, represents a kind of subaltern rebel figure. It's not at all. The dandy right. figure is a much more useful um, figure. And also what I'm trying to ar argue for is what's happening before the generations of musicians who achieved renown. So I'm kind of speaking about a couple generations earlier that started to make their way into the, 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 the well, in Nicholas Turk's terms, the little kings and landlords, you know, once the kind of imperial regime dissipates. So these musicians would not have been allowed in the imperial courts. You see them start to flourish in the landlord's courts and the little king's courts, which to me, again, is a symptomatic of the power of the state declining. Uh, and it's not just the emergence of music as entertainment, you know, kind of Wajid Ali Shah narrative, but that these musicians with these kind of impertinent politics are also entering. So there's a lot of these wonderful stories. I'm just trying to link up these stories with a kind of a, well, you know, what does it mean to think about a subversive movement that's not utopian and affects its own hierarchies, but it's not just a straight line of continuity to the Mughal courts or to the Vedic treatises, but represents a really creative reinvention of of tradition that is uh, both modern and its kind of permutational mathematical sources and modern and its uh, social mobility aspirations. Right. So uh, just, uh, Sajad, sorry, uh, just uh, one, one more uh, thing. So I'm having a, a bit of a difficulty because I just don't know enough probably. Uh, uh, putting together these two parts of your uh, presentation. Yeah, so prelad, to my mind, so you know the general category that people have, is the categories that people we work with, we laymen work with, are classical and folk. Yeah. Um, so can you say something about that? Because prelad doesn't seem to be in the same uh, kind of uh, genre to the layman. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, same genre as uh, some of the other music that you played us. That's right. So the moment there is a sitar, you know, my uh, I, I'm like, okay, now we're uh, listening to classical, uh, and uh, uh, prelad, of course, won't. You know, there's no sitar. The, so, uh, so that, there's that question. If you could clear up that, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, relatedly, uh, where does Kumar Gandharv fit in all of this? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the sitar is a relatively recent, you know, 18th, 19th century instrument. That's less relevant in answering your question. But what I'm arguing is that the musicians that constitute the Bharadri that I've talked about actually came from, uh, I mean, multiple different communities, but they came from what we call functional music communities, which is to say musicians who are participating in what you're calling folk music. I, I would call it maybe folk and popular music. Popular meaning it, not for the aristocracy. <laughs> it's, you know, for, for the rest of us. Um, and that, you know, I had the opportunity to study from Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan Sab, you know, a Kavali singer. And he he's linked to this Paradri, even though, you know, one might argue he's descent, he's descendant of the what, what you would call the folk tradition. But they're all from the same family and they're all learning the same repertoire. Um, and so when I studied from Nusrat uh, Khan Saab, he would teach me Kavali songs, but then he knew I played the sitar, so he taught me some bandeshas from uh, the Patiala Grana, which is he's linked to. Um, and, and so from a, from a genre perspective and an audience perspective, you can see these differences, elite, popular. But if you trace this migration through the figure of the musician, the, the boundaries are less porous because the musician is moving between these different audiences with a repertoire that's been inherited over generations. And so the repertoire is not just an elite classical repertoire of Drupad, uh, it's also a popular repertoire of, of you know, what we'll call love songs, devotional songs. Um, and I would argue that the modern Hindustani music really represents a hybrid stitching together of 
the folk and popular with the kind of elite. So this kind of, let me contrast two movements, right? Uh, one is the Alap, which is a non-song-based um, uh, form, for lack of a better word, a kind of an elite form. That kind of movement you're going to hear at the beginning, it's called a lot. It's translated terribly as introduction because it's not a preface, right? In the Hegelian sense of a, uh, a preface is giving you an overview of what's to come. It's a snapshot. It's a, you know, we read the, we read the introduction no more when we had too many assignments and we didn't want to read the three books that Partho assigned to us. We read the intro, but the Alap is translated as introduction, but in fact, it's not a foreshortening. It's actually you, uh, you know, where a composition is going to tell you in a minute, the aesthetic, landscape. The lap is gonna you have to you have to smell each flower. <laughs> and the permutation combinations allow you to smell each flower in the lot in the landscape. song-based, and this is also in the in this uh, tradition, and I'll play something that might signify something more lilting. played in a concert, but this is really drawing on, again, what you're going to call some of the folk idioms. Um, this is a tumri, and a tumri itself has a kind of uh, bhajan, bhakti, sufi kind of theme behind it. Uh, and what I'm trying to suggest is the lyrics of the songs in the classical tradition don't maintain this anti-hierarchical gesture. Those lyrics become secularized and eroticized. But the narratives of musicians, such as the ones that I presented today, uh, the politics moves from the lyric as it gets secularized and even hagiographic to the narratives of these lineages. And that's where you see the politics uh, present, as well as in these pedagogical relationships and these innovations of uh, pedagogical and performance forms. So, um, yeah, if we look at if we look at it through the lens of the musicians who are coming from the similar community, and many of these musicians were Cavalli singers, um, you know, in the 19th century. They don't ponder some evidence that he was a Cavalli, you know, his family were Cavalli singers. So that then, the, from the figure of the musician, the, the lines between the folk and the classical get blurred because it's the same set of families performing in both venues. And this is also true kind of religiously as well. It's still not uncommon to find Muslim folk hereditary musicians playing in temples, uh, even in this day and age, right? Uh, uh, so sorry, if the, I hope that wasn't too long an answer to your question. No, no, that's great. Uh, and Kumar Gandhar? Yeah, so he represents um, uh, one, of the, one of the ways in which music moved from the courts into the popular, into the public sphere was theater. Uh, and uh, Janaki writes about this a lot. And, Kumar Gandhar, he, he studied from um, one of the lineages that um, introduced a more um, modern devotional bhakti uh, that's less anti-hierarchical and more kind of <laughs> religious in the way that, you know, we're collectively trying to critique. Um, and uh, he inherited 
uh, both the public sphere opening of the tradition through theater, as well as the more kind of religiously devotional elements of a more conformist uh, and modern bhakti, which is uh, what, uh, so again, I'm not trying to say he's inauthentic, but I, I wouldn't position his politics as um, similar to the kind of genealogy I'm trying to lay out here. Okay, Shobha Murdgal, one, his disciple probably would fit more what you're saying. Yeah. Maybe yeah. because she sings some of that Kalam of Kabir. That's which right. Is the kind of thing that you were citing. Yeah. Uh, Sajad, thank you. Uh, I mean, you know more about this, but um, I, I was uh, interested in this, uh, I guess the kind of fairly obvious point that this kind of emergence of this juxtaposition of heterodoxy and tradition, both with respect to music and uh, the lyrics, um, as well as the accounts, the sort of anecdotal accounts of the biographies, is is very much happening in a time, you know, when you have the, the emergence of nationalism and especially the emergence of religious nationalisms, where um, any kind of ambiguity is perhaps um, less acceptable, right? Um, and maybe that sort of uh, uneasing kind of sitting together continues till till independence. But then what happens after that, right? So you know what, what sort of memory does remains of uh, precisely this kind of oppositional performance? You know, you, you, we talked about the 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 physical presence of of the musicians, but also the um, what they were producing. What what happens uh, after that? Uh, because certainly when one looks now at music in, I guess most, you know, if you think outside of a concert setting, you know, one's thinking of uh, music and film, one's thinking of music in um, platforms as you had examples of Coke Studio. You know, these are probably the places where most people would, would encounter it. So does any of that remain? Uh, what happens to it? Does it become somehow um, further hybridized in a different direction? What, what, what happens when it becomes even more popular, so to speak, or globalized? No, no, it's, it's absolutely. Um, so I would say what happens after, and let's treat kind of 1947 as the, just as a shared kind of what happens after. I would say, though it happens before, I would say the figure that Dandy in Noman's terms really starts to explode um, uh, less post-1857 and more around 1947. So it moves from um, a kind of colonial feudal impertinence to the kind of modern dandy figure. So I'm speaking about the figure of the musician, you're asking about the, 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 the public sphere more broadly. Um, you, you already kind of suggested what happened. So I actually still, you know, I'm an optimist and I, I look at the glass half full. I still think there are, you know, I view this tradition, and I use that term in a kind of capacious sense, um, as still fundamentally dynamic and uh, open. There are these orthodoxies and there are these kind of bowing to discourses of purity and tradition, that's all there. And so this is kind of dialectical, but you, you know, most, I was telling you already, right? I mean, Mr. Fateh Ali Khan uh, taught me khayals as, 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 as I was learning uh, Kabbalis. Uh, Zia Mohidin Dagar, a very austere troupe, would teach me uh, <laughs> Kabbalis, right? So this, these musicians and the kind of domains they work through are still carriers of a kind of a hybrid heterodoxy. How does that manifest itself? That's the other, that's, that, that's kind of where I'm hearing your question. And there things are, you know, a little bit more limited in, in the way that, in the ways that you've talked about. Um, uh, in devotional settings where religion starts to, where the spiritual, starts to have a more religious connotation, right? That as, as Noman set up uh, the series. Uh, but you do have other uh, Bollywood film. I would say anyone who's familiar with any uh, song prior to the 1990s, uh, this is a song form that itself represents a kind of hybridity of the orchestration that, you know, is coming from the kind of, you know, European format, but with a rag approach and a song approach that's fundamentally of this idiom, right? The kind of the bandesh with the antara, uh, the rag organization, um, you know, 
lyrics that are drawing on a kind of uh, uh, Kumri and, and uh, Ghazal form. Uh, others have done a lot more work on the popular possibilities as well as the mass kind of degenerations of that. But there, but I think in um, film song is where you probably see the most um, explicit expansive possibilities as well as capitalist restrictions um, in, in this tradition as it moves into the 20th century. And as we move further into the 21st century, right, Kali Yu get all, it's it's becoming that that what I'm talking about is becoming less legible um, in, in Bollywood, but uh, uh, Coke Studios, absolutely. Um, uh, if we had more time, I, I actually, when I first saw this, I was a little uncomfortable. Part of my quote unquote tradition was, you know, guitars, Coke, and, you know, but what she and Raiz Hansab, who's late, he's also related to the Quraadri I, I come from, and what they perform is just exquisite. And, um, and, um, explicitly um, anti-orthodoxy. So uh, I, I will end my answer uh, with a naive optimism that, um, that the plurality and heterodoxy of these inherited traditions is um, uh, alive. And I'm saying that for, as, as a, from a perspective of a disciple and the spaces that they can maneuver in uh, the social domain uh, remains to be seen for all of us, which is, uh, that's my one small proselytizing gesture. <laughs> and that's, that's interesting because of, um, I mean, as you mentioned yourself, especially in the 21st century, it's, uh, it's the fact that there's so many sounds, there's so many musical traditions that people are familiar with. So it's not just, you know, uh, to simplify it, the, the kind of the elite versus the popular, but also there's you know different Western forms. There's like other forms of music coming in, and, and so there's there's so much in the mix, which then also informs the way in which music is then constructed. I think in things like film, um, and right. uh, even in something like Coke Studio. But uh, perhaps the other thing, I mean, if one was going to be quite um, you know kind of down about the Kaliyug, then the other point one would might say is that um, well, what's happened with with our musical literacy, right? So um, is there a, a fundamental shift in the audiences in the way in which they respond? So, uh, you know, one thing could be if you look at a, at a concert setting, uh, I mean, clearly that, that must have changed in the last uh, 50 or 70 years, just even knowing, um, knowing what is required in a sense of an audience. Uh, you know the way one sits with it, and you see, and you see in different settings um, how this plays out. Um, what sort of response there is? Um, is there ecstasy, ec ecstasy? Is there not ecstasy? Uh, you know, the, there's so many things that you see in, in different kinds of performances, small or large, and 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 I wonder what role things like um, basic kind of other literacy, not just musical literacy, plays within that. That's right. That's right. Well, I started off with this kind of framework to begin with, because one of the things that, um, you know, applying pressure against a kind of a historical understanding is music as an aesthetic and understanding aesthetics as a kind of apolitical high art kind of, and, and thinking about aesthetics in a way that's more familiar to those of us who, you know, whether it's Greek aesthetics, Indic aesthetics, you know, Islamic, it, where, where, what's learned is not just musical literacy, but it's the uh, semiotics of embodied response, right? I mean, you know, the whole point of this is not just to, in the, in the long array of history is not just the scene of the concert hall, uh, but a, a, um, uh, a, a different kind of praxis. And um, that is not as um, prevalent, uh, today. Uh, I would say it's prevalent in what we call functional music. Uh, I'm trying to introduce it pedagogically in, you know, educational setting, which is to say not yet another school of music, right? But how do we think about this in kind of different dispositional orientations, right? What does it mean to embark on Udiyaz uh, or holding a breath for uh, a note for 23 to 30 seconds when it's not 
subsumed within kind of commercial ideas of meditation, you know, you know, yoga kind of merging or, you know, you know, how might we think about this as stances of 21st century comportments, you know, that are, you know, Noman and I are having this discussion. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, what, is, what does it mean to enter into these disciplines, um, uh, uh, disciplines of the self? Um, and I'd like to say secular disciplines of the self that are drawing on these spiritual and classical and popular, not just narratives, but conceptions of practice, of embodiment, of, of aesthetics and aesthetics in a social and political sense, not just in a high art and a historical sense. Um, so now I'm answering your uh, question vis-a-vis -vis, um, my own <laughs> uh, pedagogical and proselytizing um, uh, desires. Uh, but yeah, you're quite right, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're in the 21st century. You know, we're, we're in, uh, I would say, let me just say one last thing, the, the kind of audience setting that you're talking about. I'm not so sure that we are seeing in the 21st century a radical break from that. That, that itself represented a break into the public sphere in the early 20th century. And I would say it really emerged post-independence. You have examples of conferences and Batuk's uh, performances in the early 20th century, yes, but the concert as a regularly occurring feature is a post-1947 phenomenon. And so I do write about the intersections of nationalisms and the figure of the musician as a national protagonist, as opposed to an anti-national illiterate, um, you know, I, I, I do pose those questions, not in, not in this paper, but I would say the concert hall is uh, not so much a 21st century phenomenon as a post-19, I'm not saying you're saying this, but a 1947 phenomena that's kind of continued, albeit um, uh, in the 21st century with, uh, uh, you know, always evolving networks of what constitutes the audience, the movement of capital in terms of why and how someone is attending a concert or listening to something and what kind of social capital is at stake you know i mean there definitely is the high art element of attending a concert all this uh, my paper assumes that all of that it doesn't contest that it assumes that as the backdrop of one of the dialectics in which we're uh of this uh other genealogy is uh i'm trying to shine light on this other genealogy to shine light on other possibilities that are Contemporary, uh, even if the 21st century is um, challenging with its um, the uh, unholy combination of nationalisms, global warmings, and migrations, and and all of that. I guess I I think you know maybe the question is, to what extent can you take that kind of approach that you have to the pedagogies, you know, to the level of something like idol, uh, or, or to, to idol ID? Sorry, I missed. The the extent idol, of, you know, sort of uh, Indian Idol and all this sort of stuff, you know, where you have these kind of very popular mass um, perform uh, sort of competitions, and and uh, in many ways they're very skilled and they do they recognizably fit within traditions, but whether you know they necessarily um, are doing that wider kind of process of of gesturing towards hierarchy to orthodoxy to sort of um, transgressing boundaries in the same way. Uh, absolutely. And let me say this. Um, and that's why I try to, my refrain is I'm not gesturing to a utopian teleology here. I, I want to be very clear about that. Uh, and what you're talking about is a part of this. But I do want to say that, again, I'm not, you know, like you said, a lot of these, forgive me, but a lot of these young, I was about to say kids, but because I have three kids, but a lot of these young, I mean, they're extraordinarily skilled. Uh, and and it is creating this other ecosystem of 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 um, learning aesthetics and whatnot. I would like to kind of introduce my work as saying, as applying pressure against the way in which this might devolve into a kind of modern classical narrative. This is, um, you know, you know, these are these kind of religious traditions, whether it's Hindu, Muslim, whether it's kind of a a, a more uh, typical devotional but the by typical I mean a more kind of mainstream uh, nationalist um, you know uh, I, 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 I'm trying to say that part of what all of us are inheriting when we're learning or we're going through the discipline that of what it takes to be able to go on to idol and do the extraordinary things a lot of these people are doing that there are these other genealogies and histories that 
can open up other possibilities. And I would even say aesthetically, uh, this is going to be a very reductive uh, uh, syllogism, but I find that many of the lineages that as soon as they become orthodox, which is say as soon as they start to close borders around what it is and what it is not, then that heterogeneity of popular folk, like this kind of this irreverent melding uh, that uh, is what I'm trying to talk about, uh, starts to go away and what comes what what returns is a new orthodoxy. So, you know, if if this is kind of a dialectic of orthodoxy and heterodoxy, I'm trying to shine the light on the possibilities of the irreverent and the um, uh, and the creative, um, and trying to uh, help open that up amongst the orthodox and national. Um, uh, Actually, you know, so I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> I'm agreeing. Go ahead. Sorry. I was saying there's a, on, on this matter, of course, there's a difference between India and Pakistan also. Uh, big difference, yeah, because of the kinds of, uh, the, the shape of the two nationalisms, which are very different, uh, obviously. I, I don't know, have you, have you seen all of these? There has just, uh, actually, it's kind of surprising. I don't know uh, if you've seen, there have been so many series and recently also this movie about Indian classical music. Uh, on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen them. There are like three or four of them uh, that, uh, you know, I've seen. And then this movie, which is actually a very depressing movie about the, you know, the classical uh, scene in uh, Maharashtra yeah, uh, called Disciple. That was a yeah. quite a uh, depressing one. But, you know, it's yeah. a great deal of variety. So, I mean, in, in India, um, I think, you know, classical music is alive and thriving. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, in, in Pakistan, obviously, it's mu uh, much more of a challenge. But I think uh, the kind of hybridity you're talking about, at least some of the musicians that I know, uh, I witness. But, you know, I want to ask you a question about that hybrid, uh, hybridity. <coughs> so, you know, uh, I remember we talked about, I, uh, as far as I can remember, we talked about Carlo Ginsberg, you know, Cheese and the Worms. I think uh, that was uh, one of the books that we read together. And, you know, uh, or I uh, had read and were discussing. Um, and, you know, in there he cites um, uh, Bakhtin, Rabelais. And, he, uh, who, uh, and in particular, he says that there was more of a circulation actually in the uh, medieval or early modern between the classes than came to be the case later. That's what Rabelais says. So from, oh, sorry, uh, Bakhtin. That's what uh, Ginsberg says that Bakhtin says. <laughs> right. uh, I haven't read Ravelais. Um, but it does seem to me that that was the case. I mean, so Amir Khosro, you know, so I also had a question about where Amir Khosro and Nizamuddin Olia fit in your, uh, if you could yeah. also illuminate that. Why is Nizamuddin Olia in the top box and why is Amir Khosro in the bottom box? But, That's you know, right. I mean, Amir Khosro also, you know, his Kalam, there's a great deal of uh, variety. So this... Uh, this I, I I would think hybridity more of uh, as a medieval feature rather than as a modern feature, uh, you know. And I think so. Th there's on the one hand that, and uh, I think the figure of the dandy also, yeah, uh, might be um, because the new order. So in the if if we posit that in the medieval or in the pre-modern, there is more of a circulation between uh, the high and the low, yeah. Um, you can see this also in terms of so Bahadur Shah Zafar, you know, he writes in Punjabi. Now today, you'll find every Mohajir thinks that, uh, you know, Punjabi is somehow, uh, you know, uh, uncouth language. Yeah, uh, this was not the case until the middle of the 19th century or the late 19th century. Yeah, uh, I think it's the, you know, kind of formation of national languages also that creates these uh, new kinds of hierarchies between languages, some are proper languages and other not, are not even proper languages, etc. You know, this uh, uh, language and dialect thing also arises. In any case, point, the question I wanted to ask was precisely this, isn't hybridity more of a medieval feature? I think there's much, you know, modern, uh, modern society, which is class society, yeah. Uh, I think the circulation of ideas between classes, uh, certainly aesthetic ideas, so aesthetics in particular. So that's why I think the dandy is also an aesthete, yeah, um, uh, is to resist this uh, uh, this very very strict aesthetic hierarchy that exists in modernity. I don't think 
the kind of very rigid aesthetic hierarchy, you know, which Bourdieu also, uh, you know, tears to shred in his distinctions, a social critique of the judgment of taste. Yeah, um, that, uh, that, that kind of rigid hierarchy, I don't think existed in the medieval period. So uh, what do you think of that? So I, uh, no, absolutely. I, I would say two things. Um, so, well, first of all, um, um, the, I would say, uh, and getting back to the paradigm and who goes where, if I were to do this in a, if I were to present this in another way, it wouldn't be that a figure goes somewhere, different songs would belong in different quadrants. So you could have a, you could have a song from Kabir that's kind of from the Western corpus that wouldn't be quite as anti-hierarchical or political, whereas the corpus from the Eastern South Asia, it would, so like even within traditions, there's kind of people belong, you know, so I'm more interested in the kind of the, the, the songs and the communities that embrace certain types of songs and where they fit. Uh, why I put um, Ms. Ahmadin in the, in the top, because he, uh, unlike Amir Khusro, kind of like Swami Haridas, resisted the, the, he didn't recognize the place of the state uh, or the crown, uh, whereas Amir Khusro was uh, a singer in, in the court. Uh, but Amir Khusro, though he is a singer in the court, he wasn't just singing for the aristocrat. His his his, his poetry and his songs uh, um, also have also, to your point, the, the, you know, the, the hybridity that moves across the elite popular is kind of embodied in the figure and poetry uh, and the consumption of Amir Khusro. So I would I would agree with your first statement that you definitely see different kind of movements in the medieval period. I would say that. What I'm arguing for is, from the perspective of these non-elite musicians, the continuity, with quotes, of this hybridity going into the modern era, in part because what you, what, you don't see this in other kind of high art traditions, and I would include Ghazal in this category, you know, the work of Amir, uh, you know, Amir Mufti or Francis Pritchett, where because a lot of the practitioners, not all, a lot of the practitioners come from the elite gentry, there is this there is this kind of specter of comparison. Is our form inferior to Western forms? That kind of dialectical question is not posed uh, by these musicians, not because they're free of that concern, but they're coming from a fundamentally different class and caste background. Their dialectic is with their elite brothers and sisters and different patronage. And though they're in this moment, right? I'm not saying that this is happening outside of history. They're in this moment. They're not as preoccupied with similar definitions of boundaries and borders. So, uh, which does happen with the more elite classical musicians. So a classical musician will draw boundaries. I mean, I've learned, right? I mean, the, the, the should, the more sh should, the pure orienting oriented musicians. So, you know, a phrase has to do this. As soon as you do this, this is not should. Now you're incorporating tumri or other kind of folk idioms, right? So there's very hard lines that are drawn as soon as one is occupying uh, a kind of a, a national or orthodox kind of structure of othering. This is what it is because it keeps out these other things, these other impure elements. Whereas this baradri and the tradition that we inherited became what it was through not policing these boundaries. It was a hybrid mix. So that's why I can play this kind of movement with I mean, the, this would not be allowed uh, in the kind of policing idioms of, of elite versus popular, this kind of mixing, let alone mixing in a performance form where they're all in the same kind of the, the two hours you're listening to before there's a break. Um, so I would uh, I would say that what I'm trying to argue for is uh, I think there's evidence, and I'm I'm speaking the language of evidence, even though it's fragmentary. Um, that that um, these hybridities are the only way that we can see the early 20th to post independence moment of this tradition that influenced Bollywood, that influenced uh, a a kind of sonic aesthetic that moved beyond the courts. Um, it's, and it, it, it's fundamentally hybrid in part because it's practitioners were not of the imperial court. And again, the last thing I'll say is, you know, 
um, our colleagues, you know, my colleagues are able to create these extraordinary genealogies of court musicians related to Tan Sen from Akbar's court to 1857. And then they'll write like Catherine Schofield, an extraordinary scholar will say, and then the, the ink runs dry. Then there's another archive that starts to emerge, but that other archive doesn't include the descendants of the musicians that are with us. That we don't see them post-1857. We see them in the recording archive in 1901, and we see them in the written archive in the 1930s, 1940s. And those of us who know them are aware of the oral histories that pick up after 1857, such as what I read today. So the oral histories pick up after 1857. Part of what I'm saying is that's evidence and negation that these musicians are coming from a different class caste background. You know, as we know, I mean, this is kind of a subalternity coming out of existence, right? The writing in represents they're moving away from subalternity, but they, they're not around, you know, for, for 60, 70 years. Uh, and when we learn about their own genealogies from them and from and as they speak to each other, uh, yeah, there's evidence that they're of this non-elite uh, set of lineages that don't have these national hangers, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, and again, I think about the book, Noman, that I still have that you lent me, which is, I can't remember the title, but Muslim Perceptions of the West pre kind of 19th century, right? Like. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Muslim perceptions of the West in the 18th century. I, uh, 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 her name is, uh, I'm missing her name right now. Uh, yes. Um, well, you know, we've been going on for a while. What do you say, Sajjad? Uh, of course, we could go on for longer, but uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, hitting the hour and a half mark. Yeah, I, I, I promise you all, we don't observe time very well. <laughs> Hopefully that's a different form of subversion. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think this has been a wonderful conversation. And um, it, as I said before, I think it's a good way of, of kind of completing the series that we've been running this year. Uh, not least because I think, you know, if you asked most people uh, whether we'd have a talk on music in a series called Islam after colonialism, people would probably say music. How does that even fit? Yeah. But, but actually what I think we've, we've shown today is that we, we've picked up lots of the themes that we've discussed throughout the year. You know, um, these are precisely the sorts of the themes, you know, about how you deal with tradition, uh, questions of hybridity, where the, the boundaries are, who polices the boundaries. Um, you know, the, the, the point you made earlier about the distinction between uh, disciplining and exciting uh, through affective means. You know, this is, these are precisely the sorts of themes that we've been discussing throughout. Um, and, and they're quite important. And even the, the issue of, of the different contexts of Pakistan and India have also come up a number of times as we've known and, and commented upon. So, um, so thank you very much that, for that um, wonderful kind of um, culmination of, of this year. Um, I think it's, it's been a, a really, as I said, appropriate and apt way of, of bringing this to a close. Crescendo. Uh, Exactly. <laughs> um, so that really just leaves me to thank, well, thank you, of course, uh, for being our speaker today um, and thank everyone who has, has watched this and will watch it later, um, hopefully um, the recording, as well as all of our speakers uh, throughout this year and those who've watched. I think it's been a wonderfully successful series. Um, I, I think we have had an impact and um, I'd like to think that the impact is, is far beyond just the mere numbers of people who've, um, who've been, been involved. And also I, th I would like to think that we've had an impact amongst ourselves and changing our own thinking as well as um, our speakers. So a number of our speakers have also said how this conversation has been really useful for them to think about what they're doing um, and how they're moving forward. So, um, I really hope we can continue those sorts of conversations. And uh, as we also indicated before, we were planning to, to have another series next year, next academic year, which will um, continue the theme, but extend it beyond South Asia. So I do hope everyone who's been watching this uh, will rejoin us so that we can continue the conversation, hopefully in um, sometime in autumn. Um, so thank you once again. Thank you.
and, and thank you for inviting thank me. So this much. That, that was yeah. wonderful. Thanks so very much. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Khudafiz.